let me say a little bit about myself. I'm a come out of a labor activist field, which some of you know, and uh, I've worked on immigration rights, uh, uh, street rights, gang rights. Um, I've been in a conference all this week uh, where we've been talking about the death penalty and the elimination. As you know, there's um, five more executions, federal executions that uh, Bill Barr and the president are trying to push through that they didn't need to do. So we're fighting that. And I've been on the phone with a bunch of activists, including Sister Helen Prejean today, uh, last night, who's visiting one of the gentlemen who's supposed to be executed this week. He asked for her uh, spiritual guidance. But, and I also do a lot of writing. I write for two Latin papers, one in Chicago and one in Philadelphia. But I, I wanted to be here tonight to be able to introduce uh, Alex Sanchez, uh, just to begin with, uh, as you can see him on the screen, a handsome Latino man. Uh, that's the last nice thing I'll say about you, is <laughs> he's, uh, he's uh, recovering from COVID. Uh, COVID uh, bit him in the lungs and sent him to the hospital. And he's been out and been using oxygen to recover. And we want him to recover because we need him back out on the streets. I met Alex about, um, I think it was 1996, uh, when I came to LA with uh, some gang members from El Salvador. Alex has been a leader in his community and he was an active member in what people call one of the most dangerous gangs in the United States, MS-13. And he had been deported to El Salvador um, a few years before I met him. And he returned because he had a son uh, Alex Jr., who was um, at the mercy of his mother, who was not doing well in society, and, and Alex wanted to come and be with his child. So he broke the law and came to the United States. And when I met Alex, um, he, uh, neither one of us was talking about restorative uh, justice. We were talking about just surviving and a little bit about nonviolence and organizing people who were in gangs in the streets. And, trying to find a better life. If, if you would have met Alex uh, then as a tough guy, uh, it would have been hard to believe the transformation he's made of himself. And he's had a, a lot of teachers and mentors along the way that have helped him. But I think the first time I saw him, uh, echoes or the, or the beginnings of restorative justice is when Alex and I did our first presentation together in West LA to a group of uh, Anglos. He'd never given a speech in front of Anglos before. And he started talking about uh, the deaths of his own homies in his neighborhood and how much that upset him. And then he started talking about people in 18th Street, which is a primary, the, the rival gang and, and the loss of their lives. And, and what a pity that was. And, and Alex began crying. I'd never seen a tough gangster cry like that. And pretty soon we were all crying because the loss of life was so great. Alex has, has been a voice uh, for nonviolence, for restorative justice, for justice for immigrants, for justice of all people. And uh, he's become a voice not only within our community in LA, but nationally because of what he's done. The US government has gotten trumped up charges and tried to deport him twice. And one of the main um, people uh, that you know were helping him were good lawyers and good politicians. Uh, and he'll talk a little bit about that. But I think Alex in the process when they were trying to deport him and trying to break up his family and break up his spirit, because Alex, at one point, he was being harassed by the LAPD, the Ramparts Division. And I told Alex that maybe he just ought to cool it and quit uh, going to our meetings and talking about nonviolence. And he says, well, I'm not going to stop. But they tried to deport him. And, and the second time, they were accusing him of being a shot caller and taking people's lives in El Salvador about being a drug dealer. First time I ever heard of drugs being deported to El Salvador. It's normally the other way around. But Alex and, and his family have come out stronger, but 
One of his great champions was Tom Hayden, ex-senator and a great uh, brother and peace uh, person. But Alex has gone a little beyond uh, just being an example and showing families and youth, connecting families with their youth, uh, teaching families and youth how to give and forgive and to understand and to build community. And he's taken on the, in these last months of COVID, he has uh, started a food program and, and has broadened it out to work with the people in the African-American community because that's one of the areas that we have to have peace and understanding and, and, and to get along, and, which is amazing. Uh, he, Homies Unidos, through his guidance, were able to talk to a candidate who was running for district attorney and talk to him about justice within the district attorney's office. Because unfortunately, we had a, uh, an African-American woman who was for the death penalty, who was uh, harsh uh, on getting sentences for poor uh, people of color and, and didn't understand what she was doing in the office. So Alex and uh, a lot of uh, the people who work on the streets with gangs, who work on restorative justice on the streets, is they pushed out the vote. And we have a new district attorney in LA who is very progressive and, and he's progressive because groups like homies uh, went to them and talked to them about what kind of justice they want. But Alex every day is a practitioner of restorative justice, not only amongst the people that are members of Homies Unidos, but with their families and the extended shopkeepers and everybody that they deal with in the community because you not only need to talk to your people, but you have to talk to the people that you interface with in the community, the churches, the shop owners, so that they understand what you're doing and you build a community of hope. So Alex is a real hero, uh, not only to a lot of homies and other people that he's helped uh, get out of violence and, and have hope, but he's also been uh, a voice for other people in other communities about what a person can do. So I want to ask Alex to tell us a story and teach us and preach to us. And I hope that you'll all have questions to give to Alex as we go along. Alex? Uh, thank you, Magdaleno. I, I think you just said everything that I was going to say. <laughs> But uh, I appreciate, it, uh, you know, all your support. Carolina and Magdaleno have, have been in, 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 in the in the Homies Unidos life since the, its inception in El Salvador in 1996. Um, unlike many uh, gang intervention organizations here in Los Angeles, Homies Unidos was imported into the United States um, because the work uh, started in El Salvador uh, by individuals that have been deported back to that country that wanted to do something different. Uh, they didn't want to be stereotyped like a lot of, uh, um, of folks that have been in prison have been stereotyped. So they uh, they met Magdaleno, you know, they met this Chicano walking down the street that hit him up and said, where are you from? In El Salvador. And, and they said, I remember them saying that um, their response was, we're from LA, but we got deported. And and just uh, the fact that they did not feel that they were from El Salvador because they were raised in the United States in Los Angeles. Um, but Magdaleno and Carolina brought in uh, their support and, and believed in them. And that's how uh, Homies Unidos started. And from the beginning, um, our Salvadoran women are, are, are strong and, and adamant in regards to their issues that initially Homies, Homies Unidos was called Homeboys Unidos. And, and they, they, uh, they uh, obviously got backlash because Homeboys is entitled to only males. Uh, so that's what this compromise in regards to Homies that was more inclusive of the women in the barrio as well. So um, I found out that this was happening in El Salvador after I uh, had survived. El Salvador uh, during 1994, 95. Um, I had gotten deported in 94 after serving a prison sentence um, and, uh, and was met with the, the suppression of El Salvador during the uh, 
during the beginning of the national, uh, the 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 uh, cap, the NAFTA, the National Free Trade Agreement between Mexico and Salvador in Canada, El Salvador and Central America and the Caribbean wanted to start their own Central American Free Trade Agreement, and um, and the investors were uh, worried of the violence that uh, was growing in El Salvador in regards to the gangs and regards to other uh, types of violence. Uh, that um, that El Salvador responded uh, by going back to that what they knew how to do during the 80s uh, was send out death squads uh, to suppress any groups. Um, and that's how they ended up targeting gangs as part of their suppression uh, to uh, violence, gang violence. So they gave them five days to stop being gang members. If not, they were going to start being executed. Uh, and obviously, um, five days went by and gang members were not able to reform within five days. And they started being executed, kidnapped and hung and shot in the back of the head. Similar uh, and same tactics that was being used in the 80s when they kidnapped or union organizers and activists and found torture and shot in the back of the head, the same MO. So um, I was there during that time and and uh, and my home was being targeted so I had to flee um, and um, and and became homeless because they they, they targeted me uh, so I was homeless in El Salvador for some time staying from home to home and that's how I ended up staying with uh, with Hector Pineda who became later the the, the, the main, one of the main directors of homie Sunil in El Salvador so during the time that he started homie Sunil, I had fled El Salvador came back undocumented back into this country, not that I wanted to. I did not want to go to prison if I got arrested at the border or inside the country for illegal reentry after being deported. But I had an obligation to be a father to a son that, had, that, that I had left behind, that the mother had, had, um, had a bath with my mom. So those things uh, uh, really were the, the main causes of me coming back um, first, Obviously that I wanted to live. I didn't want to die and be shot in the head and hung on the pole as a, as a way of uh, leaving the gang. I did not want to be part of the gang anymore, but obviously uh, the repression uh, forced us to continue uh, having protection within the gang instead of getting caught on your own. So I ended up coming back, uh, just, just, um, just the experience of coming back um, as an adult um, uh, was horrific. I got kidnapped by the Federales with a group in, in Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, we, um, we, we, we almost died in a train, uh, trying to jump a train in, 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 in uh, Brownsville, Texas. Uh, and uh, we ended up um, getting caught a couple of times in Mexico and deported to, back to, to El Salvador. But my experience as a migrant, it's it really what drives me uh, to also advocate for immigrant rights. You know, the experience that I experienced with other immigrants coming up, uh, and, and especially uh, the group, the diverse groups of people. There was a national civil police officer from El Salvador in the group that was gay. You know, there was uh, other another gang member. There were people from Peru and Guatemala. And just listening to the stories, you, 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 you humanize. You're not just listening to migrants coming, fleeing violence. You, 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 you put a name to a person, you put a story to a person. You know? and, and, and those are those are the people that I remember when they talk about it, migrants, immigrants coming in. I remember those people that were coming with me and they weren't coming for an American dream. They were coming for survival purposes. They were fleeing, they had paid, they, they had, that has sold their land, their homes, just to make money, just to travel, right? So anyhow, I finally did make it to Texas. And from Texas, uh, uh, I was able to make it to Los Angeles and meet my son for the first time and, um, and, and became a father. I, be, I got me a job at a you know, sweatshop, making the minimum or wherever you know, the boss wanted to pay me. I worked hard, I was happy you know, that I was keeping away from problems. I wasn't a disgruntled employee. I, I was just happy to have a job and to be here with my son and safe, right? Uh, but then I met Magdaleno and everything changed. 
you know, he brought these homies from El Salvador, including Hector Pineda, who I had stayed with him during the time that the death squads were persecuting me. Um, and they took me against my will, but they took me to a Santa Cruz uh, with Nane Alejandres, uh, another brother that does a lot of gang work in, in Santa Cruz with an organization called Barrios Unidos. And that's where uh, I opened my eyes. And, and, and I like to say that I was reborn in Santa Cruz because it was all about the work that, that they were doing. Uh, it was the uh, hope that they were giving people. Uh, and I had never seen so many gang members together talking about peace and unity and reform and, 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 and opportunities and employment and, and just having the future. And, and, and I said, well, why hasn't anybody come down to my block to do this, right? Uh, and, and that was uh, what I was inspired to uh, come back and, 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 and to Los Angeles and do something. I didn't know what. I was going through my own changes, you know? I was trying to do good. I was trying to stay away from drugs. I was trying to stay away from the gang. Uh, but it was difficult to do it on your own with any guidance. Um, but eventually I was able to, uh, to have Magdaleno introduce me to uh, Senator Tom Hayden at the time, uh, which became uh, a good friend of mine. And then uh, uh, another sister by the name of Silvia Beltran, who was a Salvadoreña that worked for Tom, that, um, that she ended up being uh, one of the biggest advocates for Homies Unidos and, and for me. Uh, so I felt that, that there was some support, but I just, I have never been around white people. You know, I, I, the only white people I knew was those that arrested me, convicted me, and then, you know, babysit me in prison and then try to get me back into prison once I got paroled. So I, it, you know, the first white person that I met was, I was seven years old coming as an immigrant kid, you know, and everybody told me, be afraid, don't, don't say who you are to this person because he'll snatch you and keep you away from, from your real family. So say that we're your parents. So, you know, to have a door open and to see the first white man in, in, in green talking about who's your parents, it's, it was terrifying, right? So um, so I, I was distrustful, even of Tom Hayden. I was like, why this white man trying to, trying to help us, right? But uh, it was all part of my healing process that I needed to go through. It was all part of being exposed to, to, to the work. Um, and I was exposed to a group of folks that were working out of the Senator's uh, office called the, the Peace Process Network. And there was all gang members that were doing work around the Santa Monica um, area uh, and, and Lennox and like west, uh, west of downtown. And, 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 and I fell in love and they supported me. And, you know, that's how I ended up doing, uh, starting uh, uh, meeting new folks. Magdaleno introduced me to Ann Cusack. Uh, and that's how we ended up starting a, a, a art program um, out of a church that, um, that gave me some space. I remember the Emmanuel Presbyterian Church was the only church in the area that didn't want to charge us and, uh, and they didn't want to force us to come to church every Sunday. You know, all the other ones wanted to, wanted to charge us. Uh, we didn't have any money. But um, the pastor there was a real advocate for law enforcement, but he heard us out. And after he heard us out, he fell in love with the idea. And after a while, you know, we started being a, Obviously, law enforcement found out that we were having these meetings every week. And that's how we ended up uh, being targeted during 2000. But well, basically since 99, uh, we started getting tar targeted by LAPD uh, from a, a, spe a specific station called the Rampart uh, Station. And uh, they were known of being aggressive. They were known of, of using immigration as a tool to get rid of people. We knew that they were corrupt. They will take drugs and handguns or plant them on you and, and set you up if they didn't like you. So um, we knew that we had lived through the eighties and nineties with that, you know? So we knew how corrupt they were, but nobody listened to us. Uh, nobody said, nobody believed the gang member when he said, that's not my gun or that's not my drugs, right? Nobody believed us until uh, they caught a, a a, uh, a gang unit officer named Rafael Perez, who ended up uh, 
ended up uh, um, caught stealing kilos of cocaine out of the evidence room. And out of that, he confessed and, and he named all the officers that was corrupt and all the cases that they had planted and people that they had shot and people that they had deported. So my case um, really opened up the, uh, the, the, the relationship of law enforcement and immigration during that time, because in 2000, they grabbed me uh, with the sole purpose to have me avoid being a witness for a 14 year old kid that was being charged as an adult. Uh, and, and, and I was a key witness of his uh, whereabouts because he had been with me all day and at the church for the program during the time that the murder took place. There was no way that he had done it. There were witnesses, but law enforcement had found a way to have people point at him at a six, in a six pack, right? You all know what a six pack is, right? Six pictures of people that look alike and they had managed to point him out out of, that, the, uh, uh, out of the six pack. And I was like, well, that's impossible. That's not, that, well, that's, that's not him. So uh, I had the choice. This was where I felt that, that, that the first restorative justice moment, you know, was that, uh, that I had to make a decision whether to let this kid be convicted of a murder he didn't do by not exposing myself as a witness and putting myself in harm's way for law enforcement to turn me over to immigration and get my ass deported, right? Which might cost me my life, but most important, I will never be a father to my son, which was my ultimate goal. Or say, you know, or just, just stay quiet or, 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 or go try to help them. And so I did, I did a lot of thinking, you know, and I said, I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I let this kid be convicted. So I did go in and, and, and pronounce myself as a witness and I was going to testify, but the same law enforcement officers ended up arresting me days before I went to trial uh, for that case and turned me over to immigration uh, for the sole purpose for me not being able to testify and get this kid convicted. It was the same officers in his case were the same officers that tried to get rid of me. So, um, so obviously, by this time, we have been harassed so many times that the senator had done a, uh, a, um, a state senate hearing on police harassment. And that's how some community leaders had, had, uh, had heard of my case, uh, like Reverend James Lawson, Angela Zambrano, and Connie Rice, and uh, Father Greg Boyle, right? All these community leaders in Los Angeles were sitting on a panel when the law enforcement officers rushed into this room, which was the church, and threatened the uh, the witnesses that were going to testify, um, looking for me because they knew that we were having this hearing. Well, I don't think they knew that we were having this hearing. They thought that we were just having a regular meeting at the church. They had been requesting the church to let them come into ears drop but the church had refused them entry for that purpose. So they decided to raid that church looking for me that day. And lo and behold, there's the state Senate hearing uh, police harassment at that moment. And, uh, and everybody got to see the police come in and intimidate people. And uh, I had not made it early, I was late. Uh, so I didn't get to see that. And so they didn't arrest me. And I was able to testify to the facts. Um, shortly after that, in January 21st, 2000, I did get arrested by the same officers that did that. And I was processed for deportation. Um, and obviously, the community had found out. And there was a big campaign to get me out. I ended up being in detention for nine months, facing deportation. Um, we ended up getting a pro bono attorney. Uh, Mark Garagos uh, from Garagos and Garagos got my case in regards of, um, in regards to other charges uh, and, and in regards to my criminal background uh, to be able to uh, see how some of those cases could be reopened and fought because I, as a gang member, you never fight a case. If you're charged for something, you plead deal. You know, it's part of the process. You know, if the cops are trying to frame you, you don't go and you say, I'm innocent. You know, you might say, nobody's going to care. 
So you plead guilty to, 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 to cases. You just wait to get the most minimum sentence because for us going to prison, it's a rites of passage, right? So prison sentences really don't, re, don't reform us. So all the three strikes and Proposition 21 to sentence kids as young as 14, uh, we're, not, we're not effective in, in reducing gang violence because part of the process in juvenile hall was to learn how to be a better gang member. Right, and then you graduate from juvenile hall, you go to prison, and and you continue your career, in regards to gangs, because that's the process. That's how you get respect. That's how you get your rights of passage. Is going to prison. So, um, so for us, going to prison was part of the game. Um, so, um, what happened to me was that all of a sudden I did not want to go to prison no more. I was tired of it. Uh, but uh, after two years, after getting out uh, of immigration, um, I was able to win political asylum. Um, and, and that's in 2000, and I'd be fighting to get my green card, which I got a couple of weeks ago. After over 40 years, I finally became legal, right? So, uh, so I continue uh, doing the work. I continue doing the work, and I... I uh, we started doing like what what do we do now you know it's like okay we have a violence prevention program well we need to do the intervention with with the ones that are active uh, we started getting letters from prison we started working with 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 folks that were in prison so we started a program called libertad con dignidad or liberty with dignity in which we started going to prison and meet with people that uh that have been sentenced to life in prison in which they already had done their minimum required sentences, but were not being released on parole because they didn't because they have immigration holds, and having those immigration holds, they needed to prove that they had a, a reentry program in the state, but a reentry program in their home country as well. If not, they will recidivate. Was is the whole idea of that, right? If you don't have a place to go, you're going to recidivate. So if you're if they feel you're gonna recidivate, then they don't release you. So all these immigrants are caught in a in a, in the cycle of of just continued uh, denial of their of their release because they don't have a home to go to or somebody to vouch for them. So we started doing some work uh, this week. As a matter of fact, right this 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 Monday, we had a delegation of mothers of those incarcerated um, go down to El Salvador where we're gonna open the first re-entry program, our first transnational re-entry program that we're gonna be helping uh, those immigrants that have done their, their time, their, they, they, they're ready to come home, uh, to be able to have a place to go to and not continue being detained and incarcerated. So hopefully by next week, uh, we're gonna have to sign a contract for a house in El Salvador, um, and we're gonna have, we already have a woman that did 12 years that called us and said, I don't have a place to go. And we were able to have our connections in El Salvador, pick her up at the airport, house her, get her all her identification stuff. Then we look for employment. This woman's on her own now. Her name is Claudia Rodriguez and she's gonna be uh, running our program down in El Salvador. So we're definitely looking and expanding that program because our work and our vision has always been about transnational connection, right? I think that our work has been uh, has been uh, uh, um, linked naturally because Homies Unidos started in El Salvador, but now we're here. We're in Denver as well. We have another brother from Los Angeles that went to Denver, started the organization there, and and we're doing work around the country. You know, we've done. We're working with unaccompanied minors. Uh, trying to help them heal this this uh this uh um this issues of 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 generational separation that has happened with our with our migrant youth where their parents leave them behind as toddlers and then 12 years later they sent for them or they're coming because of the violence and 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 parents expect that their kids are gonna come and hug them and say how much they love you mom and that's not the reality the reality is that there is this 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 culture clash that many of these youngsters are facing and they're going into communities where gangs that they're fleeing from exist 
And also, it's not the honeymoon stage with your parents only lasts about a month when they start asking questions like, why did you abandon me? Right. And 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 that reunification, it's not a it's it's just a um it just doesn't last that long. And then the parents for the first time are, are, are knowing who their kids are, you know, they basically have been sending money and letters all this time. They really don't know who their kids are. So their kids are being are being also uh, told that they got to work to pay for their uh, uh, coyotes uh, fees, right? The, the, the smugglers. And, and you have six year old kids now working full time jobs in the evening, trying to trying to pay off those debts. On top of that, they're facing with siblings that they didn't know that don't like them, that they don't even want to speak Spanish. Uh, they're dealing with parents. So the, these kids are, are finding themselves homeless in the streets of Los Angeles here and elsewhere because there's really no centralized program. But we felt that Homi Sunido had the experience. So in 2014, when this came to light in the Obama administration, well, yeah, during the Obama administration was that we were trying to be proactive in, in regards to what's going to happen to these kids once they get to the community. The, the larger national immigration um, organizations that were called to try to deal with the program, with the problem, did not address the issues uh, in regards to what's going to happen in their communities once they're there. Their worry was they got to have representation because they're juveniles. They got to have mental health because of their problems they had, their trauma, you know, and they got to be reunified with their families, which were three of the major issues that the advocates were fighting for. And I was saying, but what happens once they are reunified? What's going to happen with the culture shock and then the culture clash, right? Many of the Salvadoran kids have never seen an African American. You know, what's going to be the response to that? What's going to be the response of the African-American community? You know, once they see these kids that are just looking at them because they've never seen a Black person or an Asian, right? All of these things I brought to the school district to try to be proactive and addressing, but they weren't, they weren't listening. Um, once they, they started getting some of these kids, they had a problem because these kids started addressing their problems that they were facing with in the school ground with what they knew, what they found out and what they were fleeing. So you had some of these kids that were um, kind of, you know, more vulnerable to other youth who were also Central Americans that were claiming gang members for protection. So you, all, you also had youngsters that were gang members that were local here all of a sudden telling these kids, Hey, we'll protect you. We're from MS-13. You know, they won't do shit to you if, you, if you're under a, a protection. So what are these kids to do? <laughs> these kids are the ones that are fleeing from the violence in Central America. They're coming here into communities where the gang started, first of all, and then they're going into a school that, that there's no programs for integration of them. And now they're having these MS-13 guys telling them, we'll protect you. So... I mean, this is what these kids are being faced with every day. So what we did was that we started a program called El Joven Noble, the noble youth, to address some of these issues of integration. But eventually in 2015, we started our first Central American Youth Leadership Conference for migrant youth, where we brought in about, uh, three, uh, about 350 youngsters um, that, uh, that from different schools to talk about the, the, those issues that were of, of importance to them, like culture clash, culture shock. And then we've had this, this conference every year where we bring over 550 newly arrived, arrived immigrants, where we expose them to all these other programs in the area. So um, our programs are not separate. Our programs are all intertwined. You know, our program is, there's a big connection with them from our company minors, to our youth at risk, to those in prison, because I go to the prisons and I talk to guys that I knew 32 years ago that are in prison still, and they were on the company minors. They were just like me. They were left behind by their parents, and years later, they were sent for. 
And we had to face the reality of not knowing who these people were, not knowing who my mom was. I was calling somebody else mom. And now you want me to call you mom, who are you? You want me to call you father, who are you, right? And this is exactly what we faced in the 80s behind the Reagan administration and the Civil War. We faced this already. So we know as homies unidos that this is all interconnected, you know, because I'm seeing this on the company minors that came in in the 80s sitting in prison. I see these kids in the streets that are hungry for something new. And uh, we can't provide all solutions, but we're doing our best. And uh, we're doing it on every level. I've been serving as a gang expert in many cases. I, uh, you know, I've been working on a juvenile case right now that they want to try them as an adult. But luckily for us, we just got a, as Magdalena was saying, we just got a new DA that we had meetings with in regards of our needs. And one of the things that he's committed to is that he's not going to try no juvenile as an adult, right? And he's going to go back and review cases of police corruption that had never been investigated, right? So those are kind of the things that we've been involved with. Obviously, there's been a lot of, uh, <clears throat> we meet with, uh, <clears throat> we have a monthly meeting with family members that have their loved ones in prisons with the ones that we work with. We have over 300 people uh, from prisons writing us. And we meet with some of their family members and we've created this, this healing circle. These families of those that have been incarcerated to life in prison have gone through such a, a traumatic experience fighting their cases of their loved ones, being blamed for whatever crime they committed and they're 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 considered part of the part of the problem of the perpetrator, but these are victims of the crime that their loved ones have committed. They're also victims of crime, and they never get any support. This 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 mothers for the most part cry when they come into our meetings because they said there was nobody for me when I needed this when I was going through this. This is the first time. I'm, 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 I'm around other mothers and talk about this. And, and it's been 20 years that their loved ones have been in prison and they have to carry that, that pain. So we have two of those mothers in El Salvador right now organizing. You know, they started a, 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 a group called Capril, El Grupo de Apoyo a Privado de Libertad. That's a support group for people incarcerated. You know, and these are mothers that have loved ones in prison that now organize here locally to educate people, other parents in Spanish, right? So our issues have been around the immigrants, right? So we're talking about the connection between the criminal justice and the immigration, right? That nobody wants to work with. Immigration, immigrant advocates don't want to deal with people that have been criminalized. And people that work around criminal justice reform don't want to work with immigration because that's not part of it, so they say. But with the mothers that we've been working, we've been part of uh, different national groups, like All of Us or None, and uh, uh, and 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 another group called Families, uh, 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 Families of Incarcerated People. It's a it's a it's a, a national uh, 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 network of families that have loved ones in prison. That our our families have gone there, and because of their involvement and not being afraid that they don't speak English, and showing up and being acknowledged they're now not afraid to speak up in any environment that they go to. So now those groups are taken into consideration our issues as criminalized immigrants, you know, that be, has become important through the criminal justice movement that had never considered people that have been, uh, had immigration consequences as part of their movement. So we've been making a lot of noise around those issues here in California primarily and, and, and the families go up to Sacramento. We go at least three or four times a year to advocate for reform. Um, they're really excited about what's happening with, with, with the new, uh, with the new uh, uh, DA, but also a lot of the prison reform that has happened here in California. Uh, the fact that, uh, that, that uh, juveniles uh, are not gonna get uh, life sentences anymore. 
Uh, they're able to 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 go out for parole board hearings earlier. Uh, there's there there's uh, we're working now on on trying to dismantle the life without uh, um, the life without sentences, which is basically like a death penalty sentence. Uh, so we're working on that as well to dismantle that. We did it for juveniles. Now we're doing. So we've been asked to participate. And I'll and I'll end that because I know that I've gone through well, a lot. I want you to talk before you end about your food program and how you're working with okay. other community groups. Por favor. All right, definitely. So um, I just want to get through this because I was able to get appointed by Hilda Solis, who's uh, who's uh, the 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 county board of supervisors here to be part of this group uh, called the uh, the Prit Group, which is the Probation Reform Implementation Team, and this this uh, group was tasked in creating the first probation oversight commission to reform the juvenile system here, basically youth and juveniles. And when they tasked me with the, uh, uh, to come up with recommendations around what programs probation should be implementing in juvenile camps, I said, none, no juveniles should be in a juvenile camp facility. Juveniles should be in a in, in a uh, in a in a uh, uh, youth development department where their uh, needs are being addressed not through the criminal justice lens but through other uh, other youth development, and um, that was our opinion and that was our recommendations and they were adopted. So out of that, the board of supervisors also created a juvenile justice working group. That basically is it's 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 been given the task to figure out what department or create a new department because all the juveniles are gonna come out of juvenile camps. So that's definitely around reform, something that's that's been beautiful to see here in Los Angeles, uh, to take away all our youth from a system that basically creates them into more um more more criminals because the juvenile system here i went through it for me it was a training ground for me to be able to go into a prison by the time i got to prison i was ready because i went through the juvenile system so it doesn't work and uh, i'm just happy that i took part of that which is now it's uh it's it's in the process of being implemented so uh, um obviously one of the biggest programs right now in which we're living uh is the uh the COVID 19. Um, as you know, I'm just going getting through it. That's why I, my voice is getting a little harsh. <clears throat> I was hospitalized for a couple of days with pneumonia, but uh, I was able to make it out. I had other friends that are doing this tip, type of work that did not make it. And I'll post the link to one of them. If you can do a donation to the family, I, they have a GoFundMe, but I'll post it in the chat. But we knew that once COVID came to, to, to Los Angeles and the talks that they were gonna close down the city uh, and the county, we and, and that people were gonna be laid off and, and go into unemployment, we knew that in our communities, the great majority of, 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 of people were not gonna have access to unemployment services because of their legal status, right? So we felt that it was important for us to respond in a way. So we started a, a our, what was called, what is known now as the Community Respond Initiative to be able to identify first our family members that were involved with us to make sure that they're being provided the necessary means to be able to be at home, like food and, and, and support services. And we started implementing uh, uh, that, that type of work. Luckily for us, most of the foundations that had given us funding agreed with our approach and we're we were able to redirect the funding to be able to uh, rent a truck uh, go to a food bank and start and start providing services uh, in the community uh, and providing food uh, we took advantage as well when we got some funding to do uh, the census so we were out there in the community providing people food and also doing the census. We were able to meet our numbers uh, threefold that, you know, they gave us more funding to continue doing the work. We started 
you know, registering all these immigrants that were really afraid to register because of, you know, the talks about immigration being involved in the census and so on. Uh, then we were able to do voter registration to our food distribution campaign as well. So we'll be doing that work. Um, in the process, we've had like four of our members that, that caught COVID. All of them have recuperated. I'm basically, a, 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 we have another one that just uh, uh, yesterday came out positive. So we halted our food distribution for this week. I got a call later today that they want to do it on Thursday for this other community. What we've been doing is that every Thursday, uh, we have a, a we started a, a, a program uh, called the Black and Brown Alliance for Justice. And initially, it was created to address the issues of, of, of police brutality, especially to those that are labeled gang members. And we were able to meet with George Gascon, who's now the DA. We were able to do protests in the community. We did a Black and Brown a unity uh, rally, which, you know, a lot of people from the east side came down over the bridge into downtown and all these African brothers came north from South Central and we met in front of the, the city hall. Beautiful, the, the videos are on the on the web, but um, we were able to also uh, bring, in, bring in black and brown together. We were able to say, you know what, let's do a black and brown breaking bread. So every Thursday we distribute food in, 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 in South Central LA, where we go in black and brown together into these neighborhoods. And we've been doing it directly, not with former gang members. We're talking about going directly with active gang members. So tomorrow we're gonna be in this neighborhood called uh, Barrio Mojados, you know, in South Central, there is a Chicano uh, uh, gang neighborhood where their homies are going to be distributing food for the community. And, and that has been the impact that I, that has had on the homies doing it is that they are acknowledged for the first time by the community telling them, thank you, mijo. Thank you for what you're doing. And these are things that they never hear. So psychologically, we're creating peace and relationships within our communities because we've gone to the Crips neighborhoods, we've gone to the Blood neighborhoods, and we've been distributing food in those areas, sharing the fruits. I mean, you should have seen some of these brothers looking at a jackfruit like it was a bomb, you know? And it was like, I don't know, I am not eating that. I don't know what it is. But then we just chopped it open, cut it open, and we started sharing that with them. And, and all of a sudden, they all want a jackfruit because they had never seen that fruit before. And, and, and so we've been sharing stories, we've been sharing uh, uh, connections, we've been breaking bread with each other, we've been creating peace through our food distribution in our neighborhoods, uh, which in Los Angeles, there's have been a rise uh, recently of, of, uh, of violence, but it's because there's not enough effort. And COVID definitely has had an impact because we're not being able to do our work in the community with active gang members, taking them down to trips to the beach and having these uh, workshops done with them that we usually do. We take them to Sacramento, we educate them. You know, obviously there's a lot more work, you know, to reform a gang member is not an easy task because you have a 15 year old kid that had been abused and battled and have issues for 15 years, how the hell is a grant for one year gonna help you change that kid? It's just not possible. Oh, but let's, let's plant the seed, once we plant the seed, these kids come back and they continue knowing that if they need us, they're there. And it's about relationships. So it's about restorative justice. It's about them being able to acknowledge that what they did in the community was hurted. And through the food distribution and our programs giving back to the community, they feel that they're giving back. And that's what's guided me in this 20 years of work that I've done is that I feel I need to go back and give in my community, give to the homies, give to our mothers, you know, and take away some of that pain that I caused at one time in my life to that community. Let me ask if there's people who have questions for Alex. That's great. I really appreciate it, Alex, everything you said. Any questions for Alex? I have a question. <laughs> um, yeah, that was really 
a wonderful story and um, it gradually gets better and better so that it seems like you're moving in a good direction and that your movement is growing and you're having more and more influence. But I'm wondering if there is still some opposition. Are there still corrupt cops that are a problem for you or planting drugs on some of your uh, the gang members that are trying to get out of it? Or in other words, is there opposition still to what you're you're trying to do? Well, surprisingly enough, uh, I forgot to mention, right, that in 2009, uh, I did get arrested on a federal RICO case. And uh, the officer in charge used to be part of the Rampart uh, uh, police station and the gang unit officer that had promised the gang that he was going to be the one taking me down. <laughs> and, and then uh, he gets me on a wiretap call that he translates into English, making it sound like I'm conspiring to hurt somebody. And he lies to the grand jury and I get indicted. And, um, you know, three and a half years later, I get my chargers dismissed, but it's three and a half years. We lost everything, everything. I lost the office. I lost the staff. The only thing that I kept was the nonprofit uh, number, and, and you know, because I knew that I was eventually going to come back. And the day that I get my charges, the, the day that I lost the office was in, in uh, December uh 2012 right in january 2012 i get my charges dismissed right it's like they wanted to see me in the streets before they even dropped the charges so what did i do the following day once i found out my charges were dismissed i started rebuilding you know i've been on the ground i know what it is to be on the ground i know what it is to start with nothing and build up so I wasn't afraid of build up. And we were able to build up the organization from zero staff to now 11 staff members, you know? And in the process, you know, I didn't sue them. You know, I didn't want to go through all that stuff, you know, because I already went through once and it was a headache, right? But at the same time, that officer got scolded. That officer is not being able to serve in cases anymore because of what he did in my case. And, and, and I, have public, I have public defenders, I have attorneys, I have private investigators that know they, if he's gonna be a witness, they call me up to try to make me a witness for the defense. Uh, so obviously the officers are not happy with me, right? But for the first time they did not object me getting city funding to do gang intervention work. So we're in our third year that we've gotten funding from the city to do gang intervention work that law enforcement has to approve or be saying, yeah. So this time they did not object to it. Uh, we try to make amends with law enforcement, but I, we'd rather not, you know, uh, we're on the other end. We're not complacent. Uh, we've been protesting Jackie Lacey you know, to lose uh, the uh, the DA's office, and we were successful. Obviously, all the uh, the police unions were supporting her, and they all know that we took part of taking her down. And now we have this uh, new um, DA that's coming in with a whole different attitude. Because for once, a DA it was not sponsored by the police unions. He was sponsored by the community and he don't owe him nothing. So that's beautiful to see a first DA that now is gonna be able to do what he feels is necessary for our community without feeling the pressure of the police unions. So obviously we're always, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I've been diagnosed with chronic post-traumatic stress disorder. You can imagine why. You know, I, I know I have cameras around my house. I have cameras in the office. I document everywhere I go. I'm always with somebody everywhere I go. I try to never be alone uh, I, um, because they could just try to do something to me. And getting my green card is part of that process for me to becoming now a citizen in about three to four years. Um, once I'm a citizen, 
They could arrest me all they want. They cannot deport me, which is their goal. Their goal has always been to convict me of a crime and get me deported, where I know that if I get over there, I'm going to be in a little hit list that they have put out for me. So definitely, I'm careful. That's why I haven't been um, too aggressive. I, I mean, I've told you all the things that I've done, but I used to be worse. I used to be in front of the police station screaming every October 22nd, the National Day Against Police Brutality, you know, um, and I used to be more rowdy. I've, I kind of settled a little and, and, and now I'm having our staff be, be that, that, that front and I'll be on the background, right? Uh, but the fact is that I am uh, still uh, worried uh, that they could do something for, uh, against me. Um, because they've been following me. They've been following me for over 20 years. Uh, the, my indictment uncovered this investigation that of over 20 years, and they still couldn't come up with nothing. You know, so obviously uh, the FBI will not rest until they convict me of something. So I need to be extra careful. Any other questions of Alex? Bert? Yeah. Um I think you've covered it. I mean, we you you made it clear that you helped uh, get a new DA, and that's so important. We've we've learned uh, how much uh, how much uh, a a good district attorney can make a difference. Yes. Um, but you also, and I think you mentioned in passing the the reform uh, measures that that passed, but. Maybe you could tell a little more about the reform. We, we did uh, advertise some on that. Maybe you could explain a little more uh, to us. Are we talking about the juvenile justice? Maybe that's it. And, and yeah. I'm, you know, I wasn't sure if it was, maybe I got it wrong. It wasn't about police. It was about juvenile justice with right. the reform. Okay. Yeah, so obviously uh, right now we're in the process of, um, of creating a, uh, a, a, a um, youth development department here in Los Angeles. There's a juvenile, juvenile justice working group uh, that meets uh, weekly and they've come out with recommendations. I'll put, I'll put some of those links on before I leave. Uh, and uh, they created a report and what they need to, they, what, and what they're gonna be expecting this department to look like to address the issues of juvenile justice in a, in a transformative way in which it's about restorative justice. So uh, that's definitely a key piece that I'm happy that I took part of it. Um, we definitely, uh, the DA has also committed behind that, that he's not going to charge any juveniles as, a, as an adult. He's also committed. That just, was, oh, and it's more of a skirt, or do you leave it like that? You just put the packages around. Okay. Okay. So there's okay. obviously there's going to be no more, uh, no more uh, death penalty cases that we're really happy about not 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 having to to deal with those cases. He's going to be looking at cases in which uh, have um, have also been uh, um, mishandled by police, uh, mysterious cases of of police corruption that have been gone unnoticed. Uh, I have at least four of them that I want to give him so he can take a second look and see if some of these people. Uh, you know, can get some remedy around uh, police abuse and corruption. Um, Alex, were, were there some legislation that passed that was positive in the terms of criminal justice? Oh, definitely. There's been uh, uh, there's been several that just passed uh, this 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 year, including including one to uh, um, to restore the rights of uh, of, of people uh, to vote. As soon as soon as they're out of a uh, prison system, uh, there was a uh, there was a uh, a um, the case was uh, um, that folks that were still on parole were not able to vote, and now that's changed behind the law that passed that restores voting rights. Also, there was a uh, um, there was a. Uh, um, uh, this other uh, bill that that really uh, 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 state bill Senate uh, Senate Bill fourteen thirty seven that basically uh, was a was a bill that that um, that made everybody uh, um, in a vehicle uh, guilty as the person that committed a crime. 
So uh, basically aiding and abating. Uh, this bill was able to change sentencing uh, in regards to folks to be sentenced for their participation in the crime, not as one uh, for all, which has been uh, the, the abating uh, where if there was a murder that took place or armed robbery with the murder, everybody got life without. Uh, now that's changing in regards of the perpetrator being able to be sentenced as he should and others uh, being uh, able to, uh, uh, to get whatever time uh, they deserve. Obviously, um, you know, at the prison, it's not really going to help them, but it'll give them a time out for them to be able to reason. Um, so, 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 so that's, uh, that's one bill that we were happy uh, to see pass. Uh, obviously, uh, there's other bills that have, have passed like AB uh, uh, 162 uh, that basically uh, uh, gives uh, uh, folks that have juveniles that have been uh, tried as adults uh, to be able to go uh, to life in prison and sentenced to life in prison to be able to have now an opportunity to go out for a parole board hearing every 10 years. Um, and that's had really changed and brought a lot of work for us because many of these youngsters that have been sentenced as adults uh, was never gonna see the daylight. They never imagined having the opportunity to be free again. And now they're going up for a parole board hearing and they don't know what to expect. And they're calling us, it's like, I need a letter of support. I need a house to live in. I'm getting deported. And it's like, I'm going in six months to a parole board hearing, I'm not ready. And we have to tell them, you're not ready, brother. You need to postpone your, your hearing instead of going in there with nothing and be denied seven, 10, 15 years for you to come back, wait, postpone it for a couple of years, and then uh, you're gonna be more ready to present your case. So we've been able to do that and help those that have been, uh, that have been sentenced to life in prison as juveniles. So that's something that we really felt it was critical to support and advocate for. Uh, obviously also there's a, there's a bill that passed that makes it illegal and it should have been illegal to Close up. And that now has also become uh, a bill that they should not, um, uh, that, they, that, that forbids any type of. Uh, You're freezing up for some reason. Oh. Maybe COVID it's, is gone. Uh, if I... Alex, uh, we can't hear you. Somehow, Alex has gone off. I, I don't know what's going on, the internet. Yes. Never know about these signals. Um, well, I, I I think we've had a wonderful visit sorry. with him, and if he can rest a minute and then <laughs> keep going, that's okay. Yeah, I, I don't know what's going on with this connection, but you never know what uh, with these, but. We may just want to wrap up and those Alex is going to post a lot of things on the chat line for us to make connections, but yeah, I just text him to see if he can come back on. And the one question I wanted to ask him, which would be to address the healing workshops they've done with the indigenous healing ceremonies with young oh yeah, that's right. Central Americans. And I can kind of, do my justice with it if anybody would want to hear <laughs> but um what i always was very impressed with is how alex connected young central americans that were feeling very disconnected <clears throat> to be in the American culture and
<laughs> you go off, Carolyn? I'm back, I think. Oh, he's back. Oh, so Carolyn wanted you to talk about the healing ceremonies you do with youth. Oh, yeah. Well, yes. one, of, one of the the most important things in regards of integration of, of, uh, of this immigrant kids in, into our communities has been that they should know their culture, right? So we we bring in the what this philosophy that's that's called cultura cura, right? You're freezing up. Cultura cura is uh, culture is um, heals us. Alex, you're freezing up. I don't know what's going on with the internet over there. He said cura, which means to cure. So right. anyways, what impressed me, so I'm going to take advantage while he were waiting for him to come back, is that young Central Americans, he would have them get in touch with their indigenous roots um, while they were, they were in the U.S. and they were dealing with a lot of PTSD in a way and a lot of um, separate separation anxiety and not not being fitting in and beginning to act out and he began these healing ceremonies where you would deal with rather than going to mental health institutes and taking drugs and psychiatrists but to work with indigenous healing strategies where the young people could get in touch with their own indigenous um roots and learn that that um the world is connected through the environment, your physical health, the environment, and your emotional health. And they would work in circles. And, and it was just lovely. And he can explain it so much better than I can. But how Central American children began to feel much more secure about who they were. And they, it was not through any kind of Western interventions in terms of drugs and or psych, psychiatric approaches. And one of the things that he's uh, really he's really gotten uh, involved in is with sweat lodges and using that uh, historical cultural process of sweat lodges to help people in healing and and listening to the spirits within them. So Alex has done a, a lot of things, which is incredible. He really has a PhD in in uh, local community stuff without ever going to college and getting a degree. So I don't know if uh, Alex is going to come back on or is able to. Cause I think question. I am again. It's just that my computer, my laptop was uh, freezing on me. I don't know. Was freezing. I, th I think your laptop may be telling you that you've probably overdone it for somebody who's <laughs> not, not been in the hospital um, too long ago. So I, 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 I think you, we want to allow you to do as much as you want because it's wonderful, but I, I don't want to take too much advantage of you in your uh, weak state. I, yep. I, 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 I just do it, my, exer my breathing exercises doing this. I talked about your healing work with Central American youth, but yes. <laughs> I've filled in as much as I could, Alex. No, it's 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 beautiful to see uh, our kids learning about their own cultures. They're coming from Central America, but they don't know who their indigenous leaders are. They don't they don't know you know what tribe they they're descendants of, right? And and to 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 break it down uh, or have our facilitators speak on, on these issues, it's really an eye opening. And we've had kids that have been able to tell us, you know, I I I went. To a Salvador schools, and I never knew about my own culture. So it's beautiful to um, to expose them uh, to our, our indigenous traditional ways, because um, many of them are so bombarded by the Western European and you know this individualism, uh, you know basic uh, uh, U.S. kind of mentalities. You know that it's all all about themselves that they want to be like, you know, the kid next door. And, and it's, it's so, uh, it's, 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 um, so they, they forget who they really are. So it's really easy and they become really vulnerable uh, to be influenced by, by, by gangs, 
by other groups, by alcoholism and other stuff to address their own things because they're not happy with who they are because people expect them to be somebody else. And, and bringing in the cultura and bringing in the, you know, the history around their, 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 their indigenous side, it's, it's to be proud and, 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 and they, they feel it because we're talking in a way that we should be proud of that other uh, part of what we have, not just the, the European side that, we, that, we, that we're mixed with, but the indigenous side that been suppressed, right, for generations and centuries and be demonized, right, and continues to be demonized. So for them to uh, get to know that and for us to be able to teach them those things have been really fulfilling. Alex, maybe because uh, it's getting late, if you want to do a wrap up so we can let people go and, and give us the links, but your last thoughts for the evening. I really appreciate everything you've said. And, um, oh. And I've been taking mental notes, so I'm going to steal your ideas. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry that uh, my computer for some reason froze on me. This has never happened before. It might be the FBI trying to make it hard for me today. <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, you can go to, uh, 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 there's a link if you can put it on the chat, Magdaleno. Uh, it's print, P-R-I-T dot county.gov print dot print no just print p-r-i-t print print maybe Kevin better do it she she listens better. yeah you can't this is hard for him okay p-r-i-t uh, p-r-i-t dot county dot gov and you will you will uh see the work that was done around uh the probation uh, reform implementation team um, that led to the uh, to the dismantling of the juvenile facilities and looking at creating a youth development okay. department. Just quick, crit.county.gov. Yes. That's it? Yeah. Okay. It'll take, I have a quick it'll question. It'll take you. Uh, oh, that's right. Um, crit.lacounty. Dot, okay. Yeah, I think yeah. LA might okay. be in there. I might be wrong because I have my notes and and, and then there's okay. also a LA uh, juvenile juvenile justice. Um, here, let me see if I can get it back. But there's no, oh, I got a space in mind. Sorry, guys. Okay. So there's a, there's a Los Angeles County Youth Justice Working Group. Uh, that's, uh, oh, well, it, they, okay, let me see. It's, the website is LAC. LAC. Youthjustice.org. Yeah. W O U T H Youth Justice. Youthjustice.org. Dot org. And uh -huh. let me just add, I think Alex and, and Carolyn, you know, we every I think everybody on this who's came to this meeting, or if they aren't already on the most almost everybody is on our uh, email list. So we can, you know, we can finish this up tomorrow and send it out to everybody. We're going to have this, this recording is going to be here too. And the recording will show that what we just did, LA can't see what, you know, the ones we put in, but yeah. I think we're going to want to know more and uh, we can highlight it on our website and, you know, that sort of thing. Ultima palabra, Alex. Uh, just that, uh, you know, I think that, um, uh, that for, for somebody like me to be able to uh, go back and, and have an understanding of, 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 of real uh, restorative justice, right? It's, it's, it's really about understanding how to, how to forgive yourself. And, and that was something that for many years, I, I did not know how to do. I was doing this work out of guilt uh, because so many of my friends have died. So many of my friends are in prison doing life sentences or being deported and in prisons in Central America, 
and and I feel like I have an obligation to 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 uh, save their kill their their children, right? Because many of their children are are being referred to me by them, and 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 so it's. So for many years, I did this work uh, without thinking about healing, without thinking about myself, without thinking about forgiveness for, for my own actions, right? Uh, so I think that part of restorative justice is about being able to do that, being, a, being able to, to understand how to forgive yourself, um, to be able to really completely forgive others, you know? And I'll tell you one thing, it was my first time ever making a donation to a campaign for a police officer, <laughs> you know? So if that's not restorative justice, you know, I don't know what it is. Okay, thank you, Alex, you're, you're amazing. And thank you all for listening in and we can always follow up with Alex some more. And thank I you, want Bert. Alex. I want Alex to come here and do a sweat lodge with us. Oh, I wish I could, but I don't have the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, whatever, what do you call them? The, uh, uh, the authority to do it. I, I can't <laughs> do it. All it's right. uh, yeah, I've seen people try to do them because they learn from somebody, but that's not the traditional ways. But definitely, uh, there are, there are in Georgia, there are indigenous communities and there are ceremonies. Uh, in different ways uh, that in every place you go, you have to ask permission uh, to those communities and learn their ways, you know, and you bring what you can to them and do an offering for their ceremonies. So definitely, if you're ever in town over here, you know, there's sweat lodges here in several places that, uh, that uh, are open. Uh, there's some sweat lodges that are, that are strictly non-white, you know, there's more that are that are open. It it depends on the on, on, on the indigenous communities, you know, that that you might want to go to. But over here, they're pretty open. But uh, but you can find something out there in Georgia. You know, all yeah. you have to do is, you know, knock on the right door. We we were lucky and uh, attended some Cherokee sweat lodges that I think really wow. saved our family when our kids became. Uh, junior high and high school, uh -huh. all, all during that, you know, at a time when kids and parents hate each other, we would go into a sweat lodge and talk, and it was great. Yeah, 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 <laughs> definitely. I mean, they could be useful for so many things, right? Yeah. I mean, when I when I first went to one, um, I experienced the first sp real spiritual connection that I had not experienced in any religion that I had gone to. Mm. Uh, I was in the, and I was in a, uh, in a journey, what I call a spiritual journey, trying to find that place where I, that I could be touched by God, you know, that I could say, I'm, I'm a believer on this on that. And, and I cannot find it until I went to a sweat lodge. Wow. I saw a vision there. Um, of a friend of mine that had been killed in 1989. And uh, at that time he came to me in spirit for the wrong purposes. And this time he came to me in spirit during the sweat lodge and he was pleased with what I was uh -huh. doing. Wow! So for me, it was amazing to have that experience uh, in my first sweat lodge. Um, so definitely I have found that, uh, that that's where I could go and be connected uh, with the creator. That's great. Thank you for that. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank for, you, uh, thank oh you so much. It was yeah. wonderful. Thank you. Really yeah. Thank it. you. Thanks, okay. Bert. Thank you. We're going to let you rest, okay. but we'll be in touch. We'll be in touch. Definitely. Okay, take care now. Okay. Bye. Bye. I'm going to close